If you're wondering how Jung and Tantric Buddhism overlap, what happens when Christian priests lose their faith, and when a theologian rediscovers his faith in Christ through Carl Jung, then this video is for you. Before we get there, however, it's important to mention the following. Everything I'm about to say comes directly from my continued mentorship under Steve and Pauline Richards, depth psychologists with 43 years each of frontline clinical experience, and personal family friends of the late Franz Jung, Carl Jung's only son. For most people in everyday life, the only real practical application of Jung would be his work on complexes. This concept was based on the work of Pierre Janet and has been hugely expanded upon since Jung's day, principally through the work of Steve and Pauline Richards and the late Professor Ernest Rossi. As dissociated subnuclei of the self-concept, that is, our autobiographical sense of self, complexes are the agents of instinctive and psychosocial maladaptation. As such, although Jung contributed to the development of the idea, they're best described, in action, as Freudian and Adlerian. In other words, they pertain to instincts and psychosocial relating. As Steve Richards has said, Freud, Adler and Jung are the three turnings of the psychoanalytic wheel, analogous to the three turnings of the Buddhist wheel of Dharma, Hinayana, Mahayana and Vajrayana, respectively. Where Jung truly went beyond Freud and Adler, and thus sits as the metaphorical third turning of the wheel, is with his work on the religious, transpersonal and spiritual aspects to life. As the quote from Steve Richards that opened up this video suggests, this specific aspect of life is rarely applicable for alleviating everyday suffering. If you get Freud and Adler, instinct and psychosocial relating, right, then it's as if you don't need Jung at all. Part of the reason for this is that attempting to construct a sense of the transpersonal for oneself through mythological or suggestive ideas is not the genuine transpersonal at all. It's a reification of a concept, which more often than not causes inflation, and then subsequently falls victim to the omnipresent and ever real instinctive and psychosocial dimensions of life. Where someone is genuinely religious or authentically spiritual, however, something which emerges as a core of their own personal myth, then Jung can truly come into his own and meet with a person's life in a deeply significant and healing way. This is the subject of today's video, taken from a recent high-level IPSA professional training seminar, presented by Steve and Pauline Richards. How do you apply Jung to the genuine transpersonal element of life? Let's find out. I wanted to uh, bring up something that Steve, we spoke about um, in your DMs. Um, so I, I, I was I was reading a book that well that you recommended on on tantric Buddhism, which was fascinating. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, and I know you've um, you've mentioned it before as the the three vehicles or the three phases of Buddhism, um, really reflecting Freud, Adler, Jung in a, re a really really interesting way, which was which is fascinating to read. Um, but in the tantric tradition, they spoke about a visualization that yeah. is important to this tantric enlightenment, yeah. um, which I found really mirrored um, meta instincts or our meta instinctual hypnosis uh, framework, yeah. which um, which was cool to dialectically syncretize. Um, and I was I was attempting it a couple of weeks ago um, and had some difficulty with it, but after. Um, <sighs> After reading this, um, I had some ideas that I wanted to flesh out here. Yes, please. Which is, which is that um, it seems like uh, Hinayana Buddhism really focuses on, well, in that Eastern tradi tradition called egolessness. Yeah. But I would imagine for us as a dissociation from your self-concept, 
Yeah. Um, and the complexes associated with it. Yes. Um, and then in that second Mahayana tradition, which I know is where Zen Buddhism, Buddhism is and a couple of those offshoots, yep. um, seems like uh, ego attitude, I believe is how it was described before, some sort of openness and um, maybe calmness in approaching the psyche in some way. Yep. Um, and then by doing that, then you unlock this sort of beautiful mystical realm after that. Yep. Um, yep. And for the tantric visualization, you have to master those two first before you can access the the tantric gods in, in some way, at least, or at least see them for what they really are, which is a reflection of yourself. Yes. Um, and so uh, I, I thought it fit so, so perfectly. So I guess my, the, the two prong question in there or the surface structure and deep structure question in there is, um, well, is, is that estimation right? And is that possible to actually use if we're conscious of what that tradition represents? And further than that, if there are, because I'd imagine there are other traditions that will touch on something similar, can you um, authentically use that with yourself or with a patient to access meta instincts without, um, I guess, washing it in IPSA terminology? Because for someone who is um, a tantric Buddhist, for example, I'd imagine you can do amazing work with them in leading them through a visualization, which is actually um, accessing meta instincts. Wow, yeah, you, you have understood that perfectly, if you don't mind me saying. Um, that's exactly as I see the isomorphism between the approaches. Um, my, my own view for, for what it's worth, and I, I accept this as a collapsed subjective waveform representation sure. of that, sure. is that there's a deep structure which you hinted at that, that links all of this up. And we have to decide where we sit with that. Um, the, the thing about the Buddhism is that it's extremely difficult to work through all three vehicles. It would be. Um, and the result that you would get at the end, I would say manifestly is no different than it would be if you use another method. So for therapy, unless someone is into tantric Buddhism or any of the, either of the other two major vehicles, uh, I, I I wouldn't go there. I would be looking for the, the deep structure because that's the most flexible thing that we have because it's that which emerges on the surface. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's a direct pretty much correlation between NLP and uh, Tantric Buddhism when it comes to uh, generating uh, performance, should we say, and um, perfect practice and future versions of yourself. You, you could change all of that into... The, uh, the the tantric deities and their peaceful and wrathful forms and so forth and it's exactly the same mechanism that's going on and, and that's the thing that's of interest to me but another thing that's really of interest to me is how do they compare with an orthodox Jungian approach to active imagination and I think they outperform both of them okay. so there's a deep structure then which we would not need to use say would not need to use uh, the, the Buddhist tradition for which will outperform Jung. There's a deep structure to that which is hidden within NLP, which will outperform Jung and will outperform CBT as well, in my experience, at what CBT thinks it does. So the deep structure then, I think, for me, is, is the important thing to access. Then you can ramify quite easily or you can move up into a different receptacle and feel comfortable with that and start to acquire the knowledge that you would need, say, to operate with a tantric Buddhist. Tantric Buddhists are very tricky people. They're tricky with themselves as well, which, which, can is, imagine. <laughs> which, which is which is funny uh, in some regards. Um, the, uh, the Mahayana Buddhists don't think that uh, the tantric Buddhism is at all necessary, of course. And this is what you see with Freud, Adler and Jung. Yeah, it's exactly the same. So again, stepping away from that, I mean, this is a conversation Paul and I've had, and I've had many times over the years, is that if you get Freud and Adler right, it's as if you don't actually need Jung. And that's a heresy. If you, if you identify in any, in yourself identify in any way with being Jungian, to say that you don't need Jung if you get Freud and Adler right. Now, the reason that emerged for us is that that's what we saw was working for people, was those two. Yeah. And that we, we had to lead them into the Jungian sphere. Yeah. 
for them to find any relevance in it at all, except for those people who presented spiritually. Uh, and at that point, I could see a direct relevance. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm thinking now of uh, one person in particular who was an, uh, an Oxford trained theologian and uh, he's deceased now, he's re fairly recently, a few years ago in his late 90s. Oxford trained theologian, a dean of Chester Cathedral in the UK, which is a very ancient uh, cathedral, um, medieval in its present fabric, built on a Roman foundation. And before that, it was the, the, the structure of it was the Praetorium, that a, a Roman legionary uh, fortress. So it, 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 it's rooted in the full cr uh, Christian tradition. Uh, and, and others, uh, including uh, people from the, the other faith, not the Jewish one, but the other, should we say, Semitic original faith, if mm -hmm. I don't mention its name, um, holy teachers um, from that I've, been, I've worked with. And at that point, Jung is in his element because what they bring, their personal myth, if I can call it that without insult to their beliefs, um, made that the appropriate vehicle to express both Adler and Freud through so they could make sense of those two. So it was needed. Whereas for most people who suffer, Jung is like, what? What's that all about? And having to adjust to the reality of people meant we had to cut our cloth accordingly. And gradually over the years, then it's as if the spiritual transpersonal side of Jung was held in reserve for when it was necessary. Um, most of what's applicable with Jung is, is complexes. Um, and Jung's complex theory, based as it is upon Janet, but still contracted, unfortunately, away from a lot of Janet's work, augments the better insights from Freud and the better insights from Adler and, and makes it very deliverable. But none of that matters when you're speaking to someone who has a religious issue of that intensity. This theologian, for example, uh, gave me his personal uh, copy of uh, the book, The Idea of the Holy by, I think it's Rudolf Otto, it's up on the shelf. And it was him who coined the term numinous and uh, mm -hmm. with whom Jung got the term, he's personally signed it, it's up on, on the shelf. And that was from the early 1990s. Um, and he saw our work as delivering an act of grace from within his frame of reference. And mm -hmm. I had to go mm -hmm. into that frame of reference and fully be there in that way and set aside my own position on things to allow that resonant field to operate. So there is a place for Jung, but where he seems to work best is at that level and with decreasing applicability as you move away from it, except where there are complexes. And most Jungians don't know what to do with them these days because they're full of archetypal inflation and fantasy. Mm -hmm. When it comes to Buddhists, um, my own um, tantric tradition is in the crazy wisdom tradition, and that they utilize anything which is an innate skill in someone and an attitude that they already have. So the use, the use of it is not resisted. And that's really why, I mean, mine wasn't a tantric sex, <laughs> crazy wisdom thing, but that, that's why that is what it is or should be what it is, that it shouldn't be for the, the, the Freudian gratification of sexuality, but the utilization of the instinct and the drive and the affect as fuel for transformation. But so many Westerners get into that because they want to, you know, gratify Freud and also the, the Adlerian element that comes in with it. And many tantric uh, teachers, including Chogram Trumpa, um, fell victim in the same way, probably far worse actually than, than Jung did. To both Freud and Adler so it's very tricky but there is something in it anyway to, my own tradition emphasizes the use of the body not in a sexual way but in a physical way so that doesn't get in the way and there are Hinayana traditions that do the same thing that say that, that being physical is really important um, otherwise we're completely cut off from our physicality and our instincts and our biology will push and deplete us and distract us and generate all sorts of things. So knowing something about these traditions, I think, is really, really helpful for the time, which will probably happen that someone comes in with an issue to do with it. And understanding the, um, the deep structure correspondence between the surface structures is really useful because you can move in and out of them that way. 
Um, but anyway, to get down to the specifics of the imagery, <clears throat> um, you could do that. You, you could do it. Um, I, I would leave that up to your own personal judgment, how far you wanted to take mm -hmm. it. Um, because with, with tantrism in particular, although the the idea is present and should be there from the beginning that it's it's not real it's actually part of you and ultimately of what they call bodhisattva the reliance that um the tantric aspirant places upon the tantric guru is complete and when you think about it that's a formula for amplifying transference massively yeah. and that's something which uh, you see anyway in depth psychology and uh, freudians and the Jungians. Most of the young is not all of them. Some are shy away from it and say, no, we don't discuss that. We just talk about dreams, which is, you know, debatable whether that can ever reduce transference. It might even magnify it by, by another route. Um, we, we could get into a, a transference hot water position if we adopt the role of a tantric guru using tantric methods. But if we can see how it's working and someone then presents, you can slip into role and move out. And if you do, what I would suggest is that you adopt a crazy wisdom teacher position, which is that you do not have to be, in strict terms, a tantric Buddhist to be a crazy wisdom teacher. You only have to have special skills. Sounds like a video game, doesn't it? But, but you, you only have to have certain skills, which uh, depth psychology will give you, that will allow you access to things by a slightly alternative route. So you kind of become then uh, an agent on behalf of uh, the tantric aspirant, as if Bodhisattva had guided you into a, a position where you can help. And that, that's a view I take if I work, say, with Christians who are deeply religious in a theological sense, sort of academics as well, um, that I kind of don't say I am like you, but I'm doing something which is agreed to by your faith. And I'm an agent, I, it seems, uh, and they they like that. They like the idea that yeah. you're yeah. being used, you're doing the Lord's work. I, I don't mean that in an inflationary way at all, but that's how they model it. Mm -hmm. And the interesting thing is that it seems that if you are intent on doing the right thing, and if, you, if your heart in the Buddhist sense is pure, then it happens. Uh, it's as if something allows it to happen. And that's independence of faith, it seems. Uh, so long as you're doing the right thing it all agrees it, the field I'll, I'll call it is so resonant that things then emerge that's how i deal with it and that's probably the best answer i could give john i think um, unless i get some feedback on that no that was that was an incredible answer um there, there there's so much there um with the piece about being able to be a crazy wisdom um yeah. teacher and not be in that tradition um is what was mentioned in the book and um, the author spoke about how um, the the American Indians are are crazy wisdom teachers in some way, even though they're not from that tradition, because there was, a, I believe, a student who asked the question um, of if you can have Tantra outside of, uh, of that tradition. And mm -hmm. it was just an interesting way he went about it. Um, and I can see how that would, um, you know, working within this, I guess, as we see it, a Jungian sphere, it can amplify transference. Yes, uh, I think I'd rather be seen as someone's father than a than a malevolent death demon or something like that. That's yeah, probably yeah. probably easier to advocate. Yeah, um, yeah. You might you might find that some people insist on projecting that onto you. I've ha I've had that happen where sure. people have hallucinated horns coming at me, and it's their demon, not mine. Yeah, you know, it's the product of the or it was this particular woman. It was a, it was a product of her religious background and uh, her struggle with herself. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know. And it seems it could be easy to easy to take on if you don't um, if you don't have your own ego boundaries um, sort of firm and up. Um, but so in using using a tradition like this to actually guide someone through an experience, because um, I've used metaphor in a lot of ways in an in a non I guess not this depth of, of trance. Right. Because I think whenever we really sink into a metaphor with someone we, re we really are in in this interesting trance-like state um so i'm working with someone who um works at a zoo they're a zoologist and um to work with their adlerian issues instead of speaking about adler there was no reason to we spoke about um how how they how they mate mammals um in the certain cages that they work in 
in little environments and how they socialize them and those kinds of things. Um, and it was really helpful. There was, we can, we can use that metaphor and, and leave some things off the table. Um, but would it work for something, you know, I guess sort of if, if we stay out of this tradition for a second, if you were working with a Christian, um, can we speak about prayer and use that? Cause we're not usually using a visualization and we're not using, uh, hypnosis, but we're using prayer yeah. or, right, we're, or we're using God or the self. Um, because I think you would actually really hurt rapport if someone's speaking about their faith and you say, which I know is, is not what you're suggesting, but I think, or I'd imagine what some unions do, which is, oh, well, that's really cool. You're interested in God and everything, but that's, you know, that's a reflection of our self. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, that's what you're really, um, you know, finding there, which I think would kill rapport instead of saying, yeah, no, absolutely. It's you, you are connecting with something much deeper. I'd love to hear more about it. And how can, how can we use that here? How can we work on behalf of God, as you were saying? Mm. Um, yeah, definitely. And of course, the, the, the kind of Christianity is going to be important too. So sure. one sure. extreme, you have the fundamentalists and then perhaps they're not that middle, the, the Catholics, because they're a bit yeah. extreme as well and so forth. And oh, yeah. so Anglicans, high Anglicans, whatever they might be. So yes, rapport would lead um, what you do. Um, in order to remain authentic internally, though, I, I personally, I, I, I never self-identified as anything, mm -hmm. but I was happy to be used by yeah. their faith as an agent to help them. But sometimes I would, I would talk about prayer in that way and talk, as I did with the theologian, about grace and an act of grace when something comes in, say, for a dream or a transpersonal experience, and they believe and you're not you're not manipulating them. You're certainly not lying. They, they believe that that their faith is, is is utilizing you in that moment. So long as you're completely honest and about that, not in a way that oh I'm, I I don't believe what you believe. I I, I try I've, I never use terms like that. I just try to use presence and authenticity based on that and a complete commitment to the person. The idea, for example, of being a pane of glass through which light of which you are not the source shines. And if um, that pane of glass is um, darkened by our character in that moment, then we cast a Jungian shadow. If, however, we're in a Buddhist sense, as transparent as we can be, then the light from that other transpersonal source may choose you to be the window through which it shines. But you are not the light. And you should not darken it in any way at all. And, and, and if a shadow is cast then from that which is coming through, then you might be the agent that's responsible for casting the shadow. So so being a, a, as humanistically present for someone and supportive w without being facile or super superstitious, superficial, anything like that seems to be the essential ingredient. If that's present, then it works. Yeah. It's an, yeah. engaged authentic, an engaged authenticity. Of course, of course. And, and yeah, I agree with you. Keeping, keeping our own transparency and um, yeah, just I, I, within, within our own beliefs and not just, um, you know, not pretending to be part of their system, whatever that may be yeah. um, is, is important, but being able to utilize the, the libido that they that they give us because if it's being poured into a certain space well that would be that would be important i think of i know i know you steve come from a martial arts tradition i uh, i studied japanese jujitsu for, for oh, quite cool. a while yeah. and um i think of how um well how we throw people and 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 things like that right how we how we use leverage and yeah. how we use momentum and it's not it's not about strength at all it's about using someone's momentum and yeah. where they give it to you um yeah. or else you're using brute force to and then it's a contest of strength right um but here, you know, it's it seems like people give us momentum in certain religious traditions and to not use it or to qualify it in some way can can lose the momentum. Yeah. Um, yeah. So. So, yeah, I was just trying to navigate that. And I no, I'd you're, imagine you're engaging, more practice. You're engaging the, the, the essence of your being, really, aren't you? Even by bringing in your jujitsu experience, that's more than only the mechanics of the throws that are there important. There's a cultural context for that. And beyond that, there's a personal distillation of your personality as it's moved through that and then ramified that is a continuum for you. It's a thread, isn't it? So that, that's all very authentic. 
And um, the idea uh, of, uh, just to go back to a crazy wisdom teacher, that's a psychopomp from a Western perspective. It's exactly the same thing, deep structure. On the surface, they appear to be different, but the function they serve is the same. Um, so if we can go to the deep structure, then we understand the surface structure and then realize what's the most appropriate way of meeting this person at their true Jungian level, at the appropriate Jungian level. But at the moment, what we're seeing, and, and, and I don't want to, to stray, I'll come back to, to what you're saying. At the moment, what we're seeing is a pseudo Jungianism being mm -hmm. branded in a, a postmodern way through Google and they're delivered by not crazy wisdom teachers, but insane ones who are, who are driven mad by their power drive. These, the, the, this is the, the internet guru. It's a complete parody on what a teacher should be. But, but yes, there are transcendent, transpersonal elements that are real. The necessity to use that is limited, it seems. Um, but when it presents, if you're ready for it, then that's another upscaling of your, your being as a human being in authentic connection with, a, with another person. Uh, but some therapies, you try and manufacture that when it's not needed uh, uh, it's not intended by the by the other person's being and it, it just gets silly and becomes superficial and hollow yeah absolutely absolutely um yeah mind, mindful of time i'm mindful of time here but um yeah i just want to know how to navigate using these um well different spiritual traditions within um within the therapy room um because i know it can it can really hurt rapport to say, oh, that's a really interesting tradition. It's actually this other thing, which, I mean, I don't think it's true anyway. Um, but then to completely sink into to a tradition, you may actually lose your, your therapeutic effectiveness. Um, and I imagine that as, as we're seeing some of these traditions do point at something else, something outside of it, and not, not making a spiritual claim in any way, but in terms of some of their effectiveness, they're pointing at something else that they all seem to share, or at least most traditions seem to share in some way. Um, so accessing that and then using that, wearing a mask of this tradition to yeah. deliver it. Yeah. Um, It'll take okay. on that form. Excuse me, Paul. I'll come no, to that's you fine. Yeah, well, the, the taking on of the mask is, is important, particularly with a, a tantric tradition, but moving it outside of that is important too, because the appearance, as you rightly say, of these so-called wrathful deities, which you tend to meet first, that's yeah. a, the internal projection, as we would understand it, of the construct of your of young shadow, sure. and uh, then or of the Freudian id, and the, the misunderstanding of the nature of, of being a human being by that internal projection. Um, so that that that's really important, I think, to, and you have grasped that to also know, as you've said, that we need not collapse into tantrism to understand the appearance of something on the inside not being the true nature of that person. There are alternative ways of modelling it. And being uh, barefoot, as Pauline and I talk about it, means that, means the adaptability in the moment of having the ground beneath your feet so you can test the ground and feel it and get the feedback of, of what is really uh, manifesting there and then. And then your adaptability to that is where you must become the pane of glass that that's a, an internal uh, trance state. It's certainly an altered state of consciousness mm -hmm. where you, you just you know clean it, boom, gone. Nothing, nothing is going to contaminate this. I'll be completely open and let it come through. Yeah. Then, then the magic happens. The magic that the youngins construct, they construct it, which means it's not real. It's 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 fake. But in the moment when when you manifest that as the immediacy of, of, of presence, that that's transpersonal. Young yeah. is in his element then, or Jungian ideas come into their elements at that point. Yeah, yeah, and that, that your membrane becomes very, in in the scientific way, becomes very open to processing those things from outside, like a pane of glass, right, with something coming through. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much. This, this, this was incredible. Definitely gives me, Thank you, John. Gives me a lot to sit on. So. Great, que great question. Thank you very much. Thank it's, you. it's allowed us to move into where we would think of it in our collapse subjective waveform that, that Jungian ideas or methods are appropriate because of the, the right register, but without distortion of them. Yeah. Cause outside of this, it doesn't seem to really fit. 
perfectly. Um, it seems like you're really, you'd have to shove someone in a box to actually get, get Jung in there. Yeah. Um, so amazing. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks, John. Thank you. Hey, Jake. Oh, sorry. Did you no, want to no, support? Well, I don't, it was, it was just a couple of thoughts. Oh, okay, 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 I, because, oh I'm sorry. Don't, sorry. don't you worry. It's whether it's even worth mentioning, to be honest Absolutely. with you. But um, I, I was just thinking that absolutely, obviously, agree 100% with all of that. The only reason probably ever to take a different approach would be if somebody had lost their faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it was harming them in some way. That's a very good um, point. But that, yeah. And that, that is a very good point. Thank you for raising it. Did you want to elaborate on no, that? Or, no, or no, should, no, should I? Come back on it, um, I, I've also had those experiences with priests who've lost their faith. I've still got letters from, from them, um, which I've kept because I cherish them because it, it was so deep uh, an experience. And uh, you can then use Young as a bridge mm -hmm. for them to either find their faith again in, a, in a, an authentic way, which doesn't. Mm -hmm move into its opposite which is either existentialism if they're lucky or nihilism if they're unlucky and phanatos then starts to, to to creep in that that would be the negative trend from that but um provided there's some uh, vestigial remnants left of the original faith then young can be used as a temporary holding space for them to access that and then reconstitute their faith the fact that mm. I don't follow their faith or believe in it and it is irrelevant mm. to the task, the human mm. task of presence and being there, there for them. Mm. Right, Paul. Yeah, well, yes, absolutely. Um, I was going to make a, a, an additional point to that, which is partly connected uh, to what Frank was talking about earlier as well, um, with respect to um, being world rejecting uh, as some Jungians are uh, and there's some you know faith can be as well uh, is that the problem with that sometimes is that um, say with somebody like Jung who could almost afford to be well rejecting because all, all his material needs were met uh, and so you could see then how it would be easy to just go straight to yeah the transpersonal and the transcendent that that most ordinary everyday average people do not have that luxury uh, and so ideas about you know being well rejecting aren't really very helpful for people who are just trying to uh survive as well as finding some meaning and purpose to their lives yeah. as well so i just i just think you have to, we have to be careful about that too because it's that idea is so intimately linked really to young uh and, and the the course of young's life and the way a lot of Jungians practice and um we most of us do not have that luxury we can't no. step outside of the collective completely um unless all those material needs are met in some way mm -hmm. and uh even the the guy you mentioned steve the the dean of chester cathedral to some extent all his worldly needs were met oh, were. it allowed him to be the spiritual man that he was mm -hmm. i mean actually he invited you into the church didn't he, he said you yeah. should you should be part thank, of the clergy yeah. yourself uh, i remember that extremely well thank you for yeah mentioning that because yeah. it, it shows what can happen it does. when you you help someone and their impression of you is that you should be like them mm. rather than the reverse that you that you see in transference when they want to be like you yeah um, a positive transference in therapy if it goes on for any length or goes into that kind of depth usually means i want to be like you yes this this time that you should be like me <laughs> which is yeah. the reverse of it yeah. which is a compliment really because it suggests I, I was able to represent what his his belief system stood for for him sufficiently for that mm -hmm. and it, it was it was it was nice it was it, it was such a touching thing mm -hmm. given his life experience and the depth of his uh, wisdom within his faith um but i do know that's not my authentic calling and you, you have to go with your authentic calling yeah that, that, that's absolutely true. And we could just make a, um, a, a another point with respect to that, uh, and this may sound inflated to say it, but I, we had the transcendent in our relationship. We did, yeah. Back then, yeah. And oh, we still did. Well, uh, <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yes, of course. But back, uh, what I'm yeah. thinking is that this uh, particular guy he'd mm. lost his relationship. His he wife had. had died, yeah. And and she was the 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 central fact of his life mm. and his world. And he would talk about how they were a team and and how they were raising their children together. And, and it was all incredibly moving. It and, was, and that yeah. loss, I think, hit him so hard. 
um, that in some regards it pushed him more into his faith. Yeah. Um, and uh, that that was the way he resolved it. But uh, and and he probably because we saw him as a couple on occasion as well. We did. Yeah. Um, socially and clinically we did yeah we, we, we did, did a bit of both yeah he became um, a personal friend he became yeah. a personal yeah. friend ultimately yeah and uh i think had he had he maintained that he probably wouldn't have had to withdraw into his faith as deeply as he did do no. um and uh you can have you can find the transcendent in relationships but it tends to be only when you've done with freud and adler yeah. sufficiently yeah. i mean it's never a complete task is it no. a complete job no. but um i just thought it was, it was important to raise that yes. because yeah. you know that that is that is a place for it as well yeah um other than through the medium of a you know a religion or a belief mm. system you can have it in your relationships if you deal with those yeah. other dynamics I mean, um, just to, I hope you don't mind john just to add some further context thing as that was oh, please. No, I don't mind um Pauline, you were pregnant with Gareth at one point. We'd already known yes, him for a I few was, years. Yeah. And at yeah. this point, he was more of a friend. And he made an offer, to, to which was so heartfelt from him, to baptise our son, Gareth. Mm. Um, and though that came from his heart, uh, it wasn't what we wanted mm. for our son at that point. You know, we would leave anything like that up to, up to him, um, except that I didn't. I'll come to that in a minute. Mm. I actually said to th th this this fellow that um would you do it in a river he said would you, rather than a church and he stood up out the church out of his chair and literally scurried out of the room <laughs> um overcome with conflict <clears throat> and when, when he came back and he sat down and he sighed and this was in his house um i said to him that's how it was originally done that's what happened between the Baptist and Jesus. That's how it was originally done. I said, it's in the Celtic tradition. And he did another big sign. He said, I will do it if, if you want, you know, and I, that was me testing him. Um, it didn't happen. Uh, I ended up doing it myself in, in a non-Christian way, but as a form of bonding with my son, I, I, with Gareth, uh, uh, I did a, a kind of a, a modern Celtic kind of ceremony where it was just me and him took him when he was a bit older, took him completely by surprise into a, uh, into a place in the country, which I, I I'd known since I was a boy myself. And I gave him that initiation, uh, which I'd never received from my father um, and handed that to him uh, as, uh, as that kind of thing. But he couldn't have done that really because he Gav wasn't his son and he would have imposed Christianity onto it as opposed to what I hoped for my son was it was a liberate an acknowledgement and a liberation at the same time, a handing down to something that was very ancient in a ritual sense, but without containing him into any faith, but uh, a handing to him of his independence, even though he's only a, a small child at the time and say that your life will be your own. Uh, to come to the conclusion that you wanted to come to. And I, I acknowledge you as your father and in a tradition of my ancestors and your ancestors, that kind of thing. So th I only mention that because uh, of, of what we're discussing and the, the transpersonal configures for people in such a personal way, doesn't yeah, it? It does. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. So it wouldn't have been right for you to enter the clergy. It, 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 it wouldn't really. I, I, I could have done it but but, done but it. i would yeah, have facsim i would have had to yes, facsimile yeah and i would have been something else in, yeah. in that kind of you clothing would. yeah but he put a lot of pressure on me he to did do it didn't amount. he yes. you know, uh, an awful lot yeah you know, and, it, and you that was um that was a consideration for you before we met as well like you, you had that mindset that if you didn't find the yes. right relationship that you would prefer to go in that direction in a religious than, direction in a yeah. religious direction yeah. than, than yeah. be in a relationship in which you weren't happy that is true yeah that is true so yeah. there was a template there really for there was. him well in you to receive yeah. his comments at least partially yeah but, but there also was for, for a buddhist path yes and, that's uh, true yes but uh, you, something you, religious something, something but you, yeah. you you work it through and yeah. it took the shape that it took and it became inevitable in that sense I, I agree with what Jung said that about his own choice of path that eventually it, it 
tells you and although there are potential variations on that you get pulled back towards what is essentially yourself mm. um and then it seemed that i, I was fated it to be an agent for other people yeah. and to do the best i could for others which is a buddhist thing and it's also a christian thing and it's it would suit many other faiths um but in a buddhist sense without attachment to outcome but being compassionate uh, and then stepping away when the job was done and that's that's the crazy wisdom idea too that you impart something that you have to give to others to help them on their way but without containing or attaching them uh, having yes. attachment to outcome yeah uh, and non-judgmental in that sense but yeah yeah thank you uh, sorry if that was an intrusion of personal uh not at all. That was that was absolutely incredible um, and beautiful, honestly. Um, Thank you. It's amazing to see how um, genuine and relating, um, be it within a family system or within psychotherapy, um, is so transcendent of of religion or ideology or political party. Which I think there's such polarization in the current zeitgeist that this, yeah. um, where you're doing truly, I mean, truly transcends it, and it's. Um, I think shows your effectiveness with people of different faiths and different um, social status or, or whatever that may be. Right, thank um, you, so thank you. That's, that's amazing. Thank you. This is the attitude we have to the people that, that we've always trained is that they have to have their own life and that, that, yes. that our role is, is to help and then yes. to step away yes. because you, you cannot shape or contain mm -hmm. another person. That, that's just anathema. There's an mm -hmm. instinctive revulsion in me to wanting to do that. Yeah. Um, but to help yeah I'm, I'm happy i'm happy to do that but you have to step away yeah you have to you absolutely have to whether that's in any in any situation well, it's, a, it's yeah. a rejection of uh Adlerian pathology really it is it, it that's is what it is it is yeah, yeah. I, I tried to be a police officer like that and that was difficult <laughs> as you might imagine because there's so many um conditioning constraints you know, the, 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 there's no free will as a police officer because you have no choice over anything. But what it did do is it, it's, um, well, you do have choice, but not at the meta scale, you don't. You, you have to fit in various things. But the micro level, your interactions with people and the effect that you can have on their life can be profound by being just a little bit different in, in terms yeah. of feeling into their needs and, and their security. And behind that, there's an instinct. The, the, there's so many instincts that can be articulated that way it's it, it's it was incredible and i was unconscious of them in the meaningful sense i was i was aware of them as responsibilities but i i wasn't conscious of the actual fundamental meaning at an instinctive level and it's only looking back really and i've been looking back for a long time now because <laughs> i've been out decades um but looking back i can see how important that was and if i hadn't have had that i may have become an esotericist or I may have even lost my mind <laughs> in the battle, you know, um, between what is within and what is without. But even back yeah. then, you, you had, I mean, obviously I've known you a very long time. You, have, you yeah. had no desire for power or control no. over people. Even no. then, even though you were in a job that would have allowed you to deliver that, mm. sometimes with some of the numbers we know now, uh, in the most awful of ways they are, uh, you, yeah. ne you never ever went there nope. i know that for a fact mm, thank you um and uh that's the way to and, and with that comes a sense of peace and contentment with yourself yeah that you could argue is transcendent yeah that giving up of power the desire for power and control over others yeah uh just because you can do that you're in mm. a position to do it gives you that contentment it does and um, does, yeah. you don't even need to consider young in that theoretical sense to bring that about you just have to not have a desire to pursue it yeah and, and you've always been that, like that's that. a really good point i hope i hope you don't mind if i just add this last one on for, for now um john when we say that if you source out freud and Adler, you don't need young you don't need young in, in what we would think of as the negative sense mm. that it's represented in pop psychology yes. Yes. It will emerge, as you put it. Young, uh, such as he is, or what he represents, emerges out from solving the other two. Mm. Uh, and then you don't have to give it structure, but at the same time, you actually live it in an authentic yeah. way. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Thanks, Absolutely. John. Absolutely. No, I resonate with that so deeply. Um, 
yeah, that's why I have real utmost respect for you both and real gratitude for what you're doing here. So, so thank you so much. We do for you. Thank you. Steve and Pauline Richards discover your personal myth. Ultimate Handbook remains the indispensable companion for clearing away complexes, aligning with your anima or animus, discovering your genomic intent, and beginning your individuation journey. We're really pleased to announce that this landmark book is now available in paperback worldwide from Amazon with a brand new chapter on the trickster function. If you're interested, you're very welcome to check out the link in the description.